of country participants didn't show up, but we have. Yeah, uh, what happened because of visa? Mm -hmm. Because of the visa. It's like when a woman is married early, in early marriage, what does it mean? The birth canal has not developed. Yes? The birth canal has not developed. So as the baby grows, the baby has no space to take the normal position, which is usually like that, a flex position. Okay? So, so you'll notice the composition of this panel is a bit different than what is on your program. Unfortunately, two of our guests were not able to obtain visas to travel um, for today's event. So Geetha Lal, Senior Advisor, Strategic Partnerships, Human Resources for Health at UNFPA, works very closely with Janet Michael, Director of South Sudan Ministry of Health, and Morsal Musawe, Executive Director of Afghan Midwives Association and Organization of Afghan midwives. So she's going to be sharing um, some of her experiences, um, particularly working with the, the partner in, in Afghanistan. Good morning, everybody. Uh, as Sandeep mentioned, uh, I'm doing this presentation on behalf of uh, Ms. Mursal Musavi. Uh, she's the executive director of the Afghan Midwifery Association. And unfortunately, due to visa reasons, she has not been able to make it. Uh, but she has been very kind enough to send her presentation to us. So this is her presentation. Uh, that I'm giving. Uh, most of you know about the extremely famous now, uh, of the community education program in Afghanistan, which has had such an impact in reducing maternal mortality in the country. And it has been recognized globally as really one of the, one of the best practices. Um, <coughs> so th uh, the first slide kind of uh, lists, uh, you know, how midwifery has developed in the country. So in the 20th century, there was, uh, uh, you know, the famous King Amanullah, who had sent 12 women from his family abroad 
um, to be trained in nursing and midwifery. So that is the first instance that one knows about midwifery in Afghanistan. And then, um, again, we all know that the country has been ravaged by war and, and conflict now for uh, more than three decades, starting with the uh, Soviet invasion in 1979, that almost totally devastated the health system in the country. In 96, uh, the very famous Taliban took control and barred women from attending school. And you, we all know about the atrocious human rights abuses and the condition of women in the country. In 2002, that's when, you know, after the war, when a little bit the, the transition started happening gradually, and there were some roughly about 400 to 450 midwives uh, totally in the country, you, you know, who started coming out uh, from the, you know, from the, from the walls, uh, as to say. And in 2004, that's when community midwifery education kicked off. And uh, uh, would like to acknowledge that it was with the support of USAID, JPAIGO, uh, you know, big partners like USAID who took the lead, and UNFPA, the UN joined in, uh, including UNFPA. And that's when community midwifery education started. So in 2014, there are now two streams of uh, higher education for midwives. One is, of course, the post-nursing, like Francis was mentioning, and one is the direct entry midwifery system uh, th that you have in Afghanistan. And starting with 460-something midwives in 2002, today in 2014, we have 4,600 midwives serving the length and breadth of Afghanistan. <coughs> So, uh, j you know, just again to uh, give you a brief background on the community midwifery education program, started as a pilot in between 2002 and four, and then this two-year uh, uh, community midwifery education program was scaled up in 2005. And uh, it started becoming more and more culturally acceptable and made it possible for women to receive training uh, near their community and actually to practice in, uh, in their communities. And uh, the, the who could enroll? Basically, people who had completed tenth grade in education, tenth uh, grade of school. And there are about 22 midwifery schools, and they are hoping that by 2018 these would be increased to about 31 midwifery schools. In fact, you know, this community midwifery education best practice has also been documented by UNFPA. It was done a few years ago. Those statistics are a little bit older. And we had a few copies which have been taken, but it's on our UNFPA website. So you'll find a wealth of information about this also on UNFPA's website. So uh, <coughs> one reason that the Afghanis always cite about the success of this program has been they, you know, what they say is they address the deployment issue before they started educating the midwives. So the midwives were actually selected with the community engagement from the communities itself, and they had a job. So when they were sent for training outside, uh, you know, to the, to the scattered schools in the country, they had a job waiting for them when they returned. And what is not in the slides, which I would like to mention to you, is, uh, you know, the Afghan uh, basic package of health services. So the midwifery program was part of that. And in addition, even the spouse, when they went back after the training to the community, they were supported in finding employment. There was child care provided for, for their children. So this whole package, you know, that the midwife should be supported, you know, there should, there should be some incentive for them to move back. That was a complete package in a, in a way which, uh, some cases it's good, some cases it's not so effective, but it, it really worked in Afghanistan. And it has been improving over the years. So uh, the midwives are deployed in their own communities after completion. A hardship allowance was provided to them. Strong support by the community leaders. You know, there are still uh, issues about women commuting and uh, tra training and educating in Afghanistan. But since they were selected by the local leaders and the communities themselves, they got strong support by the community members themselves. And, and, it, and now there are opportunities for higher education that we are working on, um, you know, b with the relevant stakeholders, like bridging programs, et cetera. And they also receive support through in-service training. So what has been the contribution of the CME program? So let's take a quick look. In 2002, the maternal mortality in Afghanistan was about 1,600, amongst the highest in the world per 100,000 live births. And in 2010, 
Um, this was really like cited as a miracle. A lot of people doubted the statistic also. Uh, it is stated as 327 per 100,000 live births. <coughs> and there has been a 28% increase in skill deliveries, a six-fold increase in qualified midwives since 2002. Actually, I think it's almost 10, if you say 465 to 446,000. Um, it has helped in actually improving the status of women in Afghanistan, and I would actually recommend that as a research topic maybe. You know, in the last session you were talking, you know, how the status has improved as the number of midwives has increased in the, in the country. And the engagement of women in the midwifery profession has led to political and social empowerment of the women. And uh, of course, this has been a result of the collaborative, uh, uh, you know, uh, the collaboration between the government, the donors, the civil society, and all relevant stakeholders. The role of the Afghanistan Midwif Midwives Association, Mursal, as you know, is the executive director. If she was here, she would have spoken about it more, f uh, far more eloquently. Um, you know, so they have, the Afghan Midwif Midwives Association is really, has been a powerful body and a powerful force in promoting this uh, CME program. And uh, they have been the voice of the profession and for gender equity. They have been also running a mentorship program for midwives. And uh, they have developed the policy and strategy for nursing and midwifery. And uh, they are also working towards the establishment of the midwives and uh, nursing, midwives and nurses Council, I think the the paper, the strategy is before the before the parliament is just waiting approval, and it sh hopefully in 2015 it should be approved. Uh, and they have be also been promoting higher education for midwives and doing advocacy campaigns for the midwifery profession and safe motherhood. <coughs> so the contribution of partners. How did the partners contribute? I think uh, there's so many in this room who who would be uh, you know who, who can talk about this. Uh, USAID, JPAIGO, UNFPA, and WHO and others have really played a big, big role um, in, in the CME uh, design and implementation. Um, uh, the second bullet, implementation of the Family Health Houses initiatives. This is relatively new. This is for providing, uh, also for providing uh, mobile services that we have started in really, really remote areas. Um, <coughs> and this is being supported by UNFPA. There's an accreditation system from the midwifery program. Um, the, the partners that help support the, the midwifery policy strategies, the council, uh, actually also leadership training of the midwives association that has also been ex uh, extensively supported. Uh, the, the higher education programs for midwifery, there's been South-South collaboration with Iran, uh, and of course the maternal health thematic fund has been steadily supporting Afghanistan in a big way. <coughs> So the way forward is uh, advocating for availability. So uh, they've taken the, the AAAQ approach here. Uh, availability has increased the number and efficiency of professional midwives. Again, the competencies that uh, Francis was talking about in the first session, that it is really ultimately the competency of the midwives that one is looking at, improving, further improving the recruitment and retention policies, uh, improving career pathways, uh, strengthening community engagement. <coughs> That's for availability. Oops. For accessibility is providing essential services free of charge, uh, improving recruitment and retention again in rural areas. This is for accessibility. Uh, as I mentioned, in some areas it's working very effectively and some not as effectively, but and there is uh, scope for improvement. Advocating for acceptability. Uh, development of policy on ex acceptable safe practices. Again, r the regulation aspect uh, kicks in here. Uh, the profession needs to be properly uh, regulated. Uh, improve implementation of the nursing and midwifery policy and establishment of the council. Better working environment and, uh, you know, modules on respectful care uh, at maternity. Uh, that's extremely important. You know, throughout the education, they need to, to learn this aspect of respectful care. And quality, um, again, apart from the others, which also impact on quality, um, strengthening the midwifery education based on international standards, that's one. Uh, again, the improvement of regulation will impact quality of care and safe, safe practices. 
and supporting the Afghanistan Midwives Association, which can then oversee the quality aspects uh, of, of, of training. <coughs> and that's it. On behalf of uh, Ms. Mursal Masavi, thank you. <coughs> Maybe Katie or Rima, you can uh, refresh my memory, but I think it was at the Global Maternal Health Conference in Tanzania where um, Rasal presented, either that or Women Deliver, but um, I, and when Roger Mark in his introduction was talking about colleagues talking about how they needed to go deliver babies, it was after I saw her present that I wanted to become a midwife, and I said by the end of today I'd want to do that again. So <laughs> um, I think you did a great job um, presenting on behalf of Hargita, so thank you. Um, so I, I feel very privileged <coughs> to be moderating this panel um, uh, today. So we're now going to be hearing from um, some from other representatives across the globe working on midwifery. We're going to hear from Marian Sabah. She's Japaigo's country representative in Liberia and senior nurse midwife. We are also going to hear from Wende, who's the director of human resource development and administrative directorate in the Ministry of Health of Ethiopia. And Samuel Kinge, who's a professor of medicine cardiology at the University of I double checked on the pronunciation of your name, but <laughs> I did not double check on the pronunciation of um, of the, this area in Cameroon. So, uh, what was that? Yaoundé. Yaoundé, Cameroon. He's the director uh, directorate of human resources as a Ministry of Public Health in Cameroon as well. So what uh, I've done is prepare a number of questions for them that'll help uh, highlight their work. And then after we go through a series of questions, and of course I'll open it up to the audience as well. So I thought we could start with Wende, if that sounds good. I wanted you um, to talk a little bit about how the government of Ethiopia pledged in 2012 to train over 9,000 midwives by 2015, by this year. Can you tell me what the, can you tell us um, what the key challenges were that prompted this action? Good morning. Uh, it's, uh, I'm Wende and mm, my background is a physician, but uh, Maybe my birth was attended by midwife. <laughs> <laughs> and can I just interrupt you for one second to mention, I failed to, that the uh, bios are um, outside. Um, brief bios are available for folks as well. Yeah. And uh, actually, when we talk about well, the, the key challenge, how the ministry has uh, really prompted on this action was in, uh, in 2009, the ministry, after looking into the maternal mortality and unmet uh, need of the mothers in Ethiopia, actually most of the time everywhere Ethiopia is mentioned as uh, the poor, uh, one of the poorest country with uh, little access for healthcare and higher mor maternal mortality and doing worse in most of the uh, services, especially in maternal and child health. And in 2009, we revised the uh, human resource for health strategy. And during the revision of the strategy, uh, we found out that the uh, midwifery number in the country or the midwife number in the country was just less than 1,200. And that's put us one midwife for 57,000 population. And those midwives, mostly they are also in uh, the urban area, and the area I have been working uh, in uh, southwest of uh, the country, just in border between Sudan and Ethiopia. Uh, there were four midwives, and we were two physicians for 360,000 population. And then that was the time actually uh, when the government, especially the Ministry of Health, looking what resource we have. At the same time, the uh, maternal mortality was at that time around 673, and most of the mothers, 94% of mothers, they were uh, not getting skilled birth attendance. So it's only 6% who are getting skilled birth attendance. And, and the education was under the auspice of uh, the Ministry of uh, Education, and that's where the Ministry of has uh, said we better uh, work together with the Ministry of Education. And 
and the expansion of the midwifery education and uh, the Ministry of Health also start to put effect and especially starting from that time, the uh, higher education, the midwifery school has increased by uh, from eight to 48 now and actually, and at that time the investment was more to uh, the degree level midwifery or the midwifery professionals. And but investing in midwifery professional, everyone of us know that it's just is not going to take uh, as long because it, it's going to take three years to, and with the number we have, we thought it's better to look into the other uh, thing because we have the health extension workers who are uh, working, who have been deployed to health extension workers in each health post is handling around 250 families, uh, each health extension worker, and giving the maternal and neonatal uh, care, especially the prevention part and family planning. But that was not enough. That was not enough. And, and that is the time we thought that, okay, we must have a better <coughs> health workforce than health extension worker. And for that, we thought, for the time, it will be best to invest on, I will call it a task sharing, just mid uh, training nurses to be a midwife who is a one year of training. Thank you. Uh, Samuel, I have a similar question for you. Recently, the government scaled up its investment in midwifery with the help of development partners. What prompted this act? What are some of the key challenges in Cameroon? Uh, maternal health challenges. Uh, thank you. <coughs> First of all, I want to apologize for my English. Uh, in fact, uh, our country went into a severe economical crisis between 1985 and year uh, 2000. And we, we had to undergo a structural adjustment program uh, with the World Bank and the International uh, Monetary Fund. And also, um, we faced a devaluation of the current currency by 50%, and we had heavy salary cuts. At uh, that time, uh, recruitment were stopped at the civil service, and some nursing schools were closed. Uh, you understand why our health system got deteriorated, and today uh, we face a heavy maternal uh, mortality uh, rate, we are at 782 maternal deaths for 100,000 uh, live births. And also the, the neonatal uh, mortality is high and it is increasing. Uh, we are at uh, a rate of 31 uh, deaths for 1,000 live births. That is why uh, we thought at the level of the Ministry of Health, with the help of our development partners like UNFPA, uh, GIZ, the French Cooperation Agency, and some donors, uh, that we need to establish a training program for obstetric staff as a priority in Cameroon. Mm -hmm. In fact, the National Census of Health Workers that we undertook on 2011 uh, demonstrated that we are facing a heavy shortage of health workers. At that time, we had only 167 uh, midwives in the whole country. Uh, so therefore, um, we launched the program on 2011 with the aim of scaling up the production of midwives. Except there for now. Great. Um, thank you for that. Miriam, um, speaking of challenges, how is the, and, and I know we heard a little bit um, about Ebola from Luke, but I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how the Ebola crisis has affected the midwifery program in Liberia. Thank you very much. For, for us, we had, the, the midwifery program in Liberia started like around 1950s with direct entry midwives and were very blessed in 2008 to have Chupaiko coming in to look at our midwifery program. And of course, Peter is here, we really honor him, you know, for <laughs> for coming and helping us because then we were like in line with ICM 
and we did all of the global standards and the competencies, all of that into a competency-based curriculum that we did two, two years ago. However, the Ebola came just like, and it affected the midwives, the same like other cadre. When Ebola started, people were not diagnosing it rightly, especially the health workers. In Liberia, malaria is, excuse me, <coughs> malaria is a very common illness. And most times, even with malaria, by the time they get to the facility, they are already have taken some other medication. And so everybody came to the facility with these signs and symptoms of Ebola, and many people were taking it as, and were saying Liberia just is only malaria. And so you don't pay special attention to only malaria. Another thing that happened was that we had pregnant people, women who were pregnant, women who had complications, especially post-abortion care, died in the first, the first few weeks because even their friends didn't want to take care of them because they were bleeding and bleeding meant that you had Ebola. Because some of the, some of the health workers that had gotten infected at the very beginning had been from a patient that reported and they thought it was she was having an abortion, and so she came to the OPD in a general emergency, and then they called the maternity people, the maternity people called the surgical people, and so by the time she had gotten to the hospital, about 20 health workers had been exposed. So everybody got like really afraid, but the worst part was really, we had about six mid midwives so far dying in the in the Ebola crisis, who got contact with Ebola patients and they got infected and died. We also had, but well, more importantly, was the whole thing about midwives. We had just got into this stage of increasing our facility birth, and it had gone from 37 to 51% facility birth. And with the, with the Ebola, people could not find facility to go to. And many people were delivering in the streets. But between that time of, it was July to, I mean, especially July to August when we had a real serious one, we had this very big decline in our ANC. ANC, especially ANC4, we had gotten up to like 80, but we went from down to 44%. And then, of course, the skip birth attendant that had gone up to, to 52 came down to 41. And institutional deliveries came from 48 to 37%. So now it's a big challenge of trying to, to go back and get things started up again. Would you say that that's what the, those are the, what's remaining challenges are to get back to that place so and beyond? Yes, get, get it ready, restarted. You know, like in Liberia, I'm, I'm listening to the two of them and I'm saying, and they're talking about worse maternal mortality. Ours right now in the 2013 DHRS, I mean, yeah, DHRS, we have 10, 1,076 maternal deaths for every 100,000 last birth. So we think that we like way up there. And so it's really the whole thing of getting back. Maybe another challenge will be in terms of midwives. Right now we have, before when the midwife first school was organized, it was like midwives went to a two year program that was really midwifery. And but they graduated and when we went out to do the task analysis when we were trying to develop the curriculum, we found that midwives were not only doing midwifery, doing ANC or taking care of mothers and newborn, they were doing everything. If somebody came even with, if a male, 56 year old male came into the health facility with hypertension, the midwife was maybe the only one in the facility. And so she had to also take care of of that person. 
And with the with the new program we have, which is three years, it helped them. They were they were graduating at, after two years, and that was the end. They could not go anywhere. If you wanted to go to university, you had to take an entrance and start all over like you have never been to school. So now we we had this challenge right before the Ebola started. We started a bridging program for you to go from this this two year program up to getting a BSc. And we had all of the midwives wanting to leave from the facility <laughs> to to now go to school. So we had to work out a, a scheme of how they would get to school and then get back to the facility. And that was beginning to work. So some of our challenges is the whole thing about having like real health facilities that meet standards for, for, for <coughs> care. You know, mm -hmm. we talk about respect for maternity care and actually meeting the standards. We develop pre service standards, clinical standards, health facilities are still not meeting much of the, the clinical standards. So I think you're you're on a panel with um, with folks that are able to speak a bit about what their governments are doing, what the ministries of health are doing. But perhaps you can um, take a few moments to talk to us a little bit about what the the government in Liberia has done to address um, Ebola I I as it relates to maternal health, as and well as well as other initiatives around maternal health. Okay, when we with the Ebola, even like us at Chipago, we introduce ourselves and we say. We were doing maternal, neonatal health, and family planning, and now we're doing Ebola. Mm -hmm. But Chipago has been very big into infection prevention. So we're a big part of the, the we have an infection prevention task force from the Ministry of Health through the, what they call the case management subcommittee. And so we develop a package called Keep Safe, Keep Serving that is being done for IPC so that our issue of trying to make sure that the health workers are safe so that they will be able to serve. And so that was being, is being done in all, all of the facilities to get health workers. We also have, we help from the donors, especially the U.S. government, PPEs that health workers can now use. So, and a few months ago, Chicago got this very big project from, the, from USAID to OFDA to now do really supervision because we're doing like training in all the facilities but with the supervision added it tend to make things a little bit better because then people realize that why are people not using the PPEs if they have and so the whole thing about the, the training, the supervision and then we have these things of making sure that facilities have the triage system so that Everyone who comes to the facility, even if you're coming for, to visit or drop something off, you have to be triaged, you take your temperature and ask questions. And then the whole thing about waste management, it was like we said in Liberia that we have started the quality improvement standards. And then what we realized was that from the quality improvement standards, it told us that we didn't have much quality. And, and it's something that now with the infection prevention for Ebola, we are trying to work on to make sure that. So it's like the government decided they're going to work with both public and private facilities. All of them going to have the same standards to meet. So that is, that is like what is happening right now. For the ETUs, most of them are closing down. Of course, we're like all excited and in a stage of counting and we got to stay. 22 or some people 23 and then we had a new case so one one more case but we haven't heard about any other case since then but even in the ETU people established the ETU and it was like for patients to come and then they realized that oh we have to put a bed and we have to have midwives to come and do deliveries because people you have e pregnant people who also have Ebola so they're working on getting that whole infection and prevention looking at the quality clinical standards, mm -hmm. infection prevention standards to get everybody to meet and to make sure we have PPE, waste management, triage, you know, they are very big on it right now. Mm -hmm. I, I know we've spent um, a bit of the last few um, minutes or, or since the beginning of the panel talking a bit about challenges, but I think uh, we should shift gears a little bit now and talk about successes. Um, 
Wendy, perhaps you can kick us off by um, talking a little bit about where Ethiopia is now in terms of meeting that 9,000 um, goal that we spoke about earlier. What happened was, as I, I was saying, in 2009 we started, uh, we taught uh, the health facility expansion, and uh, sorry, teaching facility expansion and decrease the uh, enrollment of uh, students. But uh, two, three years later, we found out that just because this is the regular generic program, it's not going to take us uh, anywhere. And then the UNFP has come with uh, the fund from CEDA. And the fund was, uh, they, were, they came with the money just to, uh, with a uh, program to give training for the existing midwifery. And the training was uh, more or less the DMOC training with the short-term training, is which takes three weeks intensive training for existing midwives. Very much expensive, and each training usually costs us around, around 1,700 USD. And the ministry uh, s said that, no, we're not going to take this short-term training. If you're going to sup support us, please just give us this money and support us in developing midwives, especially the task shifting. Because we have, uh, as Ethiopia, one of the success stories is just in developing uh, nurses. We have at least a uh, much better number of nurses and uh, just accelerating midwifery program, training nurses to uh, the UNFP, they went back and they discussed it with their funders and they came with the, uh, accepting the idea and we worked together and uh, the plan at that time was to train 4,600 midwives in three years with the accelerated midwife program. And well, the program uh, started in the health science college with TVATS and with a good monitor monitoring mechanism and finally a licensing exam or qualification exam after they finish uh, their program. And we achieved the number. Now we have, uh, after uh, three years of the uh, program, we have achieved uh, the number we have planned. And there was uh, uh, an, uh, an assessment, the program assessment. And actually, the program assessment uh, found out even the uh, uh, midwifery quality uh, was better than the uh, midwifery. We have been teaching in uh, the diploma program in the, uh, the accelerated midwifery program has been found very much in better shape. And those midwiferies, because they are nurses with existing uh, job in uh, the health sector and agreeing with the regional health bureaus and they send them for one year training and uh, when they graduate, around 99% of them has gone back to their job and they have been deployed to each health center. In the country, we have around 3,000 uh, health centers and now each health center do have at least one or two midwifers and one health center is serving for around 25,000 population. And, and those midwiferies, they have a link with the uh, health extension workers in the uh, ground who are working in the community with the 16 packages and with the focus in the maternal and child health. And at the same time, when we see what the uh, effect of those midwiferies, one of the good news was uh, usually they're really championing the maternal health in and actually uh, Bringing, we can see that it's bringing result because in the last uh, four to five years, the uh, skill birth attendance ha has increased about 10 times. That's from 6% to this year, 54%. Uh, uh, and that's a big achievement for the country. And even the uh, contraceptive prevalence rate and the others is increasing. Ethiopia, because we have started, the maternal mortality was, uh, rate was very high. Uh, last year, UNFPA, uh, WHO, and uh, 
the uh, UNICEF uh, result, uh, released a data that the maternal mortality has decreased now to 420. But the good news behind this is that every year the maternal mortality is decreasing around 5%. That's a big number, but from where we have started, that's really, uh, uh, really slow. I think you knew that my next question for you was going to be how you um, measure the effect of the initiative on maternal and newborn health, but I think you, you did answer <laughs> you that. You knew. You could sense that was coming. Um, so, Samuel, perhaps now you can spend a few minutes talking to us about how the government in investment in midwifery has, how it's been successful in Cameroon. <laughs> yeah, thank you. In fact, globally speaking, um, our aim was first of all to strengthen our health system. At the moment, our health facilities coverage is not that bad. We have uh, seven uh, reference hospitals in the country for highly specialized care, uh, 12 regional hospitals, 188 district hospitals for um, tertiary care, and 1,600 integrated health centers for primary care. We also uh, increase the production of health workers um, in the nursing schools and at the university. And uh, to a certain extent, we increase the recruitment of health workers at the civil service. Uh, now, as concerning reproductive health, we invest in strengthening the capacities of the providers in maternal and neonatal care who, who are not midwives, but nevertheless, they are providers. Um, so what we have been able to achieve now is that we launch a midwifing training program in 2011. At the moment, we have established 10 midwifery schools. Uh, on that training, we have uh, 750 midwifery students, and uh, we welcome our first batch of midwives uh, last uh, at the end of uh, the, the last year. Uh, there were 183 uh, midwives. The good news is that um, thanks to a decree of the head of state, all the, the, mid the graduated midwives shall be recruited in the uh, civil service. Uh, and if this is uh, maintained, we expect that uh, every year we shall increase the number of midwives on the field. Uh, so hopefully we shall move from 200 midwives on 2015 to 1,183 midwives by 2020. So this will uh, allow the ratio of midwife over the number of women in childbearing age to move from one uh, midwife for 30,000 uh, uh, women uh, today to uh, around one midwife to 7,800 women of childbearing age on 2020, which to us is a significant Increase. increase. Absolutely. We also... Um, we are experiencing some <coughs> projects in order to, to promote access to healthcare for pregnant women in the northern part of the country uh, where we have the, 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 the worst indicators as concerning uh, reproductive health. This is done with the help of our development partners like uh, UNFPA, but also the French Cooperation Agency and GIZ. So there we are trying to promote uh, what we call chèque santé in French. I will translate that as subsidized vouchers uh, that are um, provided to women at a very low cost. Um, a voucher costs uh, 14 uh, US dollars and it cover all the need for um, a safe pregnancy and delivery. And uh, we have another uh, uh, type of um, project. It covers what we call subsidized kits for delivery. Uh, that also include uh, cesarean sections. It costs 120 US dollar. 
So if you compare this to the, the cost of other type of, um, of care of health services, this is really a low cost. And you know C-section, uh, when it is over at this cost, we believe that it will really be of great help to women. Uh, to a certain extent, we are also experiencing with the, the World Bank a performance-based um, financing, and this um, will um, motivate the health workers because it includes it include um, incentives uh, that are given to to health workers. Uh, in a nutshell, so that's what I can say. Thank you. Thank you. So perhaps we can shift gears a little bit, and one day you can talk to us a little bit about how you're ensuring quality. Uh, before we go that, I want to add some additional actual information. In Ethiopia, the maternal uh, care is uh, for free. And actually now th the government has initiated the maternal days audit also. And every uh, lower level uh, as uh, administrative units uh, the, in the government sector has actually uh, the accountability to audit each maternal days. And that's one of the initiatives started. And when it comes to the quality of this, uh, the midwifery, uh, I'll take it from pre-service uh, to uh, the in-service uh, or uh, when they after they have been deployed. In the pre-service uh, education, uh, what we have is now, uh, because their curriculum was a, uh, is a competency-based curriculum, and with the logbook, and most of their training is, because the training of midwife now in Ethiopia is under the regional health bureaus. It's not under the, uh, the Ministry of Health, uh, Education. That means they have the service in their hand, they have the uh, exposure sites. And we are developing in the Ministry of Health, uh, we are developing this quality improvement standards and by annually there is a supportive supervision. And at the same time, uh, there is uh, the uh, teaching, effective teaching methodology training for the uh, midwife uh, tutors and and UNFPA with uh, Japaigo, they're supporting us actually in, uh, when we see the health science college, they have a better skill lab now with libraries, skill labs, and uh, teaching materials more or less, and the infrastructure is being covered by the government, but the teaching learning materials is being supported by UNFPA programs. And we are uh, almost paying tuition fee for the Health Science College uh, supported by UNFPA and the Global Fund. And mostly the tuition fee is for quality improvement and pocket money, uh, money for the midwives. And compared to the uh, short-term training, actually the long-term, the one-year training costs us one third of the cost of the short-term training. The 21-day training was supposed to cost was will train three midwives actually. And we are using that money now for the quality improvement. And in addition to that, uh, when after they have been, uh, they have finished their uh, study, they have the competency uh, test in uh, each region by the uh, independent uh, TV8 organization who, uh, who uh, will uh, assess the quality of the midwife, is where they are, whether they are fit in giving uh, uh, to give service or to be deployed to the service. And after they have been deployed, what we are doing is with uh, the uh, Midwifery Association in Ethiopia, that's actually the strongest association we have, and they are doing, an, uh, first they have done a performance assessment of those midwives on the site, and following that, there, there was a recommendation to uh, bring, deploy experienced midwives and deploy them to the uh, lower level and to support those midwives on uh, the monitoring and support for about uh, three to six months. And 
following that, we have this the short term training and com uh, competency, the continuous professional development for those uh, midwives. So perhaps maybe now we can go down the line. Um, Samuel, perhaps you can kick us off and talk about plans moving forward. And, and Geeta, I realize uh, that might be a little difficult, um, it, you know, since you are presenting on behalf, but if you do want to add to that as well. So plans moving forward, Samuel? Yeah, thank you. Um, the way for forward, first of all, we would like to implement the recommendation of the audit of the midwifery school that was undertaken on 2014 and to correct all the weaknesses that uh, were elicited during this audit. We would also like to establish an accreditation system uh, for the midwifery school and maybe also for the clinical training sites. As for the accreditation of health facility, that's another challenge which is out of the scope of this discussion. We hope to launch our e-learning platform uh, for midwifery education. And also we intend to, to start a study to monitor the, 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 the outcome, the fate of midwives uh, with time. Uh, we intend to align the midwifery training program with the international bachelor's, master, and doctorate program. Uh, we are doing this uh, within the framework of MIPAD, and maybe this will be done with the help of uh, South Africa. It's not yet settled. We intend to deploy and retain uh, midwives in priority areas. And we know this is a big challenge, but we intend to, to tackle it. Thank you. For us, what had happened that, like I was saying earlier, we had got into the process of looking at the quality, pre-service quality standards along with clinical standards for the clinical sites. We are also got it from Chipago, with working with Chipago, we had done the accreditation and relicense or licensing policies with the Midwifery Council, but just like the way with the ICM, we have gone into this process of looking at the education, getting the curriculum, getting the standards, looking at accreditation for old schools and new schools. But now we thought that it needed to be extended, and this whole thing of trying to work with both the nurses, with the, with the Midwifery Council, looking at education, regulation and the association. They w the, the three of them came together to work, so we need to really expand on that. We really focus a lot on two schools. We need to like extend to the other schools. But it is very important that we keep that whole process of quality assurance ahead of us. So we're looking at ways that we can do that and also to work with the with the BSc programs, people have started looking at the curriculum. And so we hope that we'll be able to continue on doing that and get the curriculum going. So, and go to other schools instead of just the two schools, get the, the regulatory bodies, which is the Librarian Board for Nursing and Midwives, midwifery to really focus on getting the pre-service standards, the clinical standards, the curriculum, the accreditation process, continual professional development, relicensure, now to get it into all of these schools and try to maintain them. I'm gonna interrupt my own question with another question. Um, so before we hear about plans moving forward in, in Ethiopia, uh, Marion, when you were speaking, it, it, it made me recall that I did want it to ask you a bit about the coordination, uh, coordination of development partners, and if you could speak uh, a bit to that. What happened is that, of course, with the Ebola, we had a lot of people coming into into country, and so what we what what the Ministry of Health sort of like established were two things, along with the government of Liberia, anyway, because the president is like the chair for the Ebola response, and so they have two sessions, and they were looking at responding to the Ebola in case management but also 
how you restore services because like we said earlier health workers had left the facilities and people were also not coming so we have two two coordinating committee that meet the the regular response meet like three times a week and the re restoration meet once every week and so all of the partners will report what we are doing and what kind of assistance you need one of the things that happened like in one of the counties we had a lot of ngos coming and many people were saying i'm in three facilities i'm in four facilities and that's what i'm doing and so we had to sit and do a matrix to say okay if you are in this facility what are you doing and then we found out that there were some people who had many facilities 20 some people even have 40 facilities but then we found out that there were the, none of the facilities people have been trained in RPC. So after we did that matrix, we were able to see exactly what the, what the gaps were. And Jibago did a lot in terms of really trying to coordinate the training and getting people trained and then organize what supervision is supposed to look like as you go into a facility using the minimum standards that we had developed for IPC. So everybody is now into these different groups. And like I said earlier, we are working in eight counties, eight of the 15 counties. So we're trying to make sure that <laughs> those counties also start their, their coordination. So they, it's like in the counties, it's headed by the superintendent or the county health officer. The national one is really headed by the president and the, the minister of health. So we tend to work that way. Thank you. The plan's moving forward in Ethiopia. The first thing is actually uh, we need uh, the one of the plan would uh, we uh, we thought with UNFPA is just generating evidences, especially in uh, the midwifery education. What? Uh, we did see it that, uh, we did observe it that there is a creeping dominance of uh, male midwives, especially when you go to uh, the upper level. The lower level uh, midwives are, uh, are uh, usually uh, women or female, but when you go up, the number of male really increases, especially in the midwifery professional. And that was really, and. Recently, we have been looking at the accelerated midwifery program. When it started, it just said that, well, this is for uh, female. But short after, the region said, we don't have the uh, pool of the uh, woman. And just we said, OK, let's bring the men. But when it go to degree program, recently have visited one of uh, the universities, and just 84% of the uh, BSCC midwifery students are male. And when you go up to the master program, one of we have two schools giving a master program in one of the schools from the 22 students, all of them are male. So they don't have female. And we have asked before actually uh, some assessment in the community saying that uh, what is really, how do women feel when they have been attended by uh, male, and it was, we don't mind. Actually, I have asked my wife, why do you feel, what do you feel? And she said, when I am in labor, I don't mind. Mm. <laughs> but the most important thing is, especially the sexual and reproductive health, I don't need one, uh, men, I just, that's what you have to ask. It's not the delivery, but the other, sexual and reproductive health. And uh, now we have uh, research going to ask all these questions, especially uh, how really the uh, women perceive the service from the male side. And the other thing is, uh, this year one of my plan is to start the community uh, midwifery training program. This is a big initiative actually, because we have around 37,000 health extension workers. They're good in working with the community. They are with the diploma programs. And I know that the next stage will be 
from accelerated midwifery program, we have to go to the professional midwife. And training those health extension workers to be a midwife, a community midwife, that will be a big achievement because we have the pool and upgrading them to one level. And that the first thing is it will give us the chance to keep the health extension worker in a place. But the other issue is it will increase the uh, service quality which they're providing. And already we're working with the curriculum. In addition to that, we have this year we have started an upgrading midwifery program. Those accelerated midwifery program now they're being trained for two and a half years to be a professional midwifery. And that's uh, uh, the an another initiative we have started uh, that with six uh, universities and now the regions are also sending us those uh, uh, midwives or the accelerated midwives. Uh, and the other is uh, especially focusing on quality of the midwifery and the d because we have this sort of double standard. For the accelerated midwifery, we have the, uh, the, uh, the uh, exam, the exit exam, but we don't have for the degree program and others. And this year, with four programs in the country, the anesthesia, midwifery, medicine, and health officers, we're starting the national qualification exam and licensing exam. And that will be a big initiative, actually, because every midwife for joining the service and every midwifery professional, they have to pass the uh, midwifery, the uh, licensing exam. And we have done already the uh, task analysis in the committee. It's not an, a knowledge exam. The exam will be what really is the community is looking for uh, from the midwifery, the service the community is looking for the midwifery. That will be the exam we are going to provide. And the other thing is the... Uh, even though there is a uh, prior uh, really significant investment uh, from the government side and from our partners, usually what we do is uh, with our partners because there are uh, different partners who are working uh, in the midwifery program, especially in the human resource development. And what we will do is we have the annual human resource forum and we'll put them together and we'll plan together. When we plan, our annual plan, usually we will share for our partners. We'll tell them this is our plan, please come and align your plan with us. And this has given us actually the synergy uh, of especially being supported by, because UNFA workers usually in uh, it just teaching learning material and JAPAIGO workers in effective teaching skill uh, training and so on. And we have got the chance to work with all partners and to synchronize uh, their work and still there is a gap especially in uh, equipping some of the facilities especially in skill labs and w at the same time the problem is with this huge number uh, going into the education uh, we don't have much teachers and at the same time the ex uh, the uh, exposure site is limited. There were some uh, talk about saying that, well, some of the midwives, they're graduating even without just attending a single uh, mother. And that was one of the big issue. And we have now started this uh, preceptor monitor uh, guideline. And the most important problem we have identified was most of the midwives, their attachment was in a big hospital. And in this big hospital, there is the midwife, the nurse, the uh, uh, intern, the uh, medical students. And what are the midwives doing there? They may need some time to go there, but the health center where you have a, a spontaneous vaginal delivery and uh, a bit complicated instrumental delivery is not uh, really teaching the midwifery. And that's now we are shifting to that side saying that, well, there has to be, because it's the health center actually which is giving the family planning service also. It's not the big hospital. Now we are shifting with the uh, how really we can, uh, we will be effectively using the uh, uh, exposure sites, especially training sites. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Dr. Abner, what's up?
talking about the brain power of the the human resources for helm which we're only focusing on midwives because of our harm maternal mortality we have a human resources for health hematopics that is now working with all of the ngos and the ministry of health to put in plans <coughs> so for the for midwifery we are looking at how we can increase the number the, like we say the quantity and the quality for midwives so we are developing a plan now with other partners in the Ministry of Health to increase midwife, the number of midwives, but also the quality. So we're looking at the whole thing of faculty development, of, of getting the clinical sites also working very well. Those are things that are part of the plan in getting the skills lab or the com computer labs and the science labs all of those things together. So that's what we are working on right now. It's like supposed to be a 10 year plan to get, at least it sounds like what they have been talking about earlier mm -hmm. is what we are doing right now. Thank you. Did you want to add something? <coughs> okay. Yeah, so, for, so, so for Afghanistan, uh, just, to, just to mention that after the launch of the State of the World Midwifery Report, Afghanistan launched its own national state of Afghanistan <coughs> midwifery this year. And uh, you know they've tried to find out the priorities and there's also, which my colleague Luke de Benis has been working on, is also a midwifery workforce assessment, you know, detailed midwifery workforce assessment for Afghanistan, which is, which is ongoing, which should be completed. And I'm sure he can, he can add to that. So that is one of the priorities to keep the agenda alive in Afghanistan and also you know, to help us plan and prioritize properly. But apart from that, uh, midwife-led maternities, uh, there was a mention of uh, family health houses there, that every maternity should be manned by a midwife. That's another, uh, that's another priority. And uh, most importantly, the, this uh, council, you know, looking at quality of care, uh, nursing and midwifery council, which is, in, which is in the pipeline, the, or, you know, all the plans, everything is ready. It, it should hopefully kick in this year. So that is uh, another another big thing. So that midwifery becomes a strong, regulated, uh, autonomous profession. So you know these are amongst some of the priorities. But uh, yeah. <coughs> so I, I know panels without PowerPoints. Um, we don't always a you aren't always able to get in um, all your points with just questions. So before I open it up to the the audience, I just wanted to see if if any of you wanted to add anything more to, to our panel, which is all about country investment um, in midwifery, or if we should open up. Okay, great. Well, um, while we wait for my colleagues to, to get on the mics to bring them around, um, I actually wanted to um, pose a question to an audience member, and I think um, Geetha just put Luke on the spot, and I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna ask you, Luke, if you could talk a little bit about UNFPA's um, Ebola response, and um, perhaps also give a brief um, on the Mono River project as well. Sure. And then I promise you, you get to ask questions too. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, and, and thank you for, for you, Madam, from uh, Liberia about what you said. And I think uh, the situation is uh, really worrying. Uh, we were happy to see Liberia going out of the epidemic and uh, this case delay the things, but more importantly, we know that uh, Liberia will not go out of uh, <laughs> of Ebola if Guinea and and, uh, and Sierra Leone are not also going out. So the fight is not ended. The attention should be maintained, and I think it's what the international community and the government are looking forward. And thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk about that because I don't know exactly what is a, the collaboration. I have to confess with uh, Gipago on that, but uh, it's certainly something we need to discuss. Uh, UDFPA took the initiative to uh, launch uh, what we named the, um, the Mano River Midwifery Response. Mano River, because as you know, probably the four countries, including uh, Cote d'Ivoire, have created a, a, a common uh, organization, the Mano River Union, and uh, aim to strengthen the collaboration. And one of the things that we would like to see with the, these countries is how we can not waiting for the end of the epidemic, but reopening, restoring services for mothers and women. Because as, as uh, you justly mentioned, many services have, have collapsed. The, the, the health personnel quit 
or infection force authority to close services, etc., etc. And now the, the fear of the population uh, uh, has uh, you know, created a situation when even if facilities exist, women don't want to go there. So we have to reorganize, reshape all this, not waiting again for the end of the, of the epidemic. And we are proposing to the government and partners, but I have to say that it's quite difficult to mobilize the partners at the speed we would have loved to do, uh, to restore facilities. So we have uh, received some support from the World Bank, from, uh, uh, from Japan, from others, uh, and from the UNMIR, the UN collaboration in, in the countries, to use some funding, and including uh, Swedish funding uh, in Liberia, with a special two million to restore uh, uh, services, and uh, we are looking at the situation, and we don't want to restore what was not working very well before. So we need, exactly as you said, to look at the situation, but in addition to be innovative and to propose, even if it is not yet in the policy, new ways of uh, acting. So we are working in, in um, uh, identifying all available midwives, including new graduates, including recruiting uh, retired midwives mm -hmm. to be leading the, the process if, it, if they can, and to restore midwife-led maternities, well connected with the communities because health workers who are working as contact tracer, which is a very important uh, activity to stop the epidemic, will be released probably soon, we hope, and become agent of change at community level to really recreate the confidence in services. And establishing uh, midwives in these uh, health centers connected to the uh, comprehensive emergency obstetric care services, which we have also to restore. So this is where we are embarked, and I'm sure that collaboration with uh, the H4 Plus, so WHO, UNICEF in particular, but also GPIGO and other partners will be absolutely uh, critical. As I said, the mobilization of the international community is still not yet there, so we hope to have more support to move faster, but things uh, have started, and uh, we hope to, to, to go there. Liberia Minister of Health has suggested that it could be a good time to review totally the maternal and human health policies and strategies, and this is what we want to do, so we can embed these changes in the coming 10 years plan to increase the resilience of the health system. So more collaboration will be perfect, and we are open to any uh, support from others. Thank you. So, so for those of you, and again, questions, I'm, I promise, I just want to make one um, quick comment beforehand. For those of you who are particularly interested in um, this conversation about Ebola and maternal health, um, as you may know, we record our events, and it was uh, in late November, if I'm not mistaken, we did a panel on maternal health in times of crisis, and I think it was just days before the event that our, our colleagues at the Maternal Health Task Force linked us um, with a nurse, a uh, Boston-based nurse, who actually wasn't Boston-based at that point. He had been in Liberia for a number of months working on Ebola. He spoke uh, quite a bit about um, health systems response then, too, and so if you are interested in that, you can um, of course, find that video on our website. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, he's actually back in Liberia as well now, um, again, doing work uh, around maternal health and Ebola. So um, as promised and much delayed, I do want to open this up for questions. I think we have our first one up in the front. And Francis. And we all know Francis, but again, introduce yourself. And uh, I, hello, everyone. I'm Francis Deister, president of the ICM. I have a couple of comments and, and one question for clarification. So, uh, I mean, thank you to the panelists. Samuel, it's wonderful to hear the steps that Cameroon is taking to introduce midwives. Um, Marian, um, the midwives in Liberia have done an awful lot of work and have suffered greatly, and their families as well, and, and we, we, we recognize that. Gita, the, the Afghanistan, uh, Gita spoke uh, for the Afghan midwives. I'd like to recommend that everyone who hasn't seen the video by Sabira from Afghanistan on the ICM website, have a look at that. It's, it's very, very good, very, very moving and in informative. I have a question for um, Wendy because 
I'm not sure whether the high rate of men in midwifery in Ethiopia is something to do with female education. And I might have got this wrong, but my understanding is that men who apply for midwif for medical education who don't make the grade are then sent to midwifery. Is, is that accurate or is, uh, have I completely misunderstood that? Thank you. We can take them one by one now if you'd, if you'd like to answer that. Uh, actually, yes, there is uh, some uh, sort of truth about it, men, because in Ethiopia, usually you'll apply, uh, when you go to college, you'll apply one to three. Uh, um, and usually if, you're, if you don't join medicine, you'll go to your second or third choice. But that's not the case. Uh, that's not always the case because uh, one of the issue is midwifery in the country. If you uh, uh, learn midwifery, always you'll have, you, you have secured your job. That's so, uh, one of the issue. And, but we're not sure what's happening, the other, what's the other reasons, because maybe the uh, university uh, female uh, enrollment rate is now this year is uh, 32 percent. It's not much compared to uh, uh, the proportion of women in the country. But that doesn't explain also uh, now the 84 percent of uh, the uh, degree program is uh, in one of the school is uh, men. And in the other side, I was trying to look actually what this looks like in the private sector. Surprisingly, in the private sector, they have to, in Ethiopia, higher education is for free. And in the private sector, they have to pay. In the sector they pay, there is no men for degree program. Mm -hmm. There is no men. While you get an education for free, there is men. And we're not sure what's happening, and that will be open actually for the study, I would say. We have some questions um, towards the back. Hi, uh, my name is Anushka Kuyamper from International Medical Corps. Uh, I just have a quick point of clarification also for you, Wendy. Um, so in Ethiopia, could you talk a little bit more about the difference between the accelerated program for midwifery and the regular program? And also um, if the HEWs, the health extension workers, are being upgraded, um, what that process would look like? Thank you. We'll take a clarifying question, then I'll start collecting questions. Uh, the difference between the accelerated midwifery program are their nurses trained for one year to be a midwife. But the regular program is a three and a half year program and uh, they will go join as a, uh, to be enrolled as a midwife and uh, they will graduate as a midwife. And the regular program actually, they don't have this uh, qualification exam, the accelerated program, they have the uh, qualification exam. and. The way we are going to go to the uh, community uh, midwifery program is uh, at least a two and a half year program. It's uh, different than the accelerated midwifery program. They have already the diploma, or they are level four. They are as equivalent as the, mid the accelerated midwifers in their level of education, except their scope. And we are going to add on top of that a two and a half year program and so that they will be qualified uh, midwife practitioners. Well, as the midwife of male gender, I'd like to comment on that, but I'm not going to. I'm not even going to go there. Uh, <laughs> what I would love to, what I'd love to hear about is how we engage pockets of expertise that are necessary in your country. I'm sitting around the room and looking, and I see that we have, you know, Centering Healthcare International. Uh, we're talking about, uh, and so new models of care represented. Uh, we're talking about midwifery-led care and enabling environments, and we have uh, Ruth Lubick in the back, Dr. Ruth Lubick uh, from the Developing Family Center. We have ACNM and their affiliate regulatory experts with the Accreditation Commission and the Certification Board. My experience in development work is a lot of these folks that have the know-how that we need, the people with the know-how, don't necessarily have the development experience uh, or they're not networked in well. 
with people that are uh, you know, at the table working on these agendas. So I'm wondering from your country perspective, if you just comment a little bit on how we better engage people and who we, you know, that may have some of the answers. Thank you. Well, I'll give you all a, a few minutes to think about that. We, we have another question toward the front here, Benjamin. Hi, Rima Jolave with the Maternal Health Task Force. Um, many of the colleagues on the panel made comments that made me think about um, the appropriate distribution of midwifery services through the levels of the health system. For example, uh, retention, Deepa talked about you know, um, recruiting midwives who will return to their communities. And Wendy talked about um, education and uh, making sure that midwives are um, educated in at the level of care where they can gain the competencies in reproductive and, and um, sexual health as well. And Marion pointed out that when there are determinants like uh, an Ebola crisis that facilities well, may be overwhelmed, but also may not be the safest place for women to give birth. And I'm reminded of the um, pandemic flu plan and, and the all-cause disaster preparedness that the work that we did at ACNM about 10 years ago. So I'm just wondering, all that together makes me think about um, how countries are planning uh, when you look at the essential services to distribute them at different levels of the health system and whether you can talk a little bit about that for midwifery. Um, I'll give Benjamin a few moments to get around to you, but perhaps we can start with those two questions. And I think Peter's question was to the entire panel, correct? So do, Samuel, do you want to kick us off and then we can, we can go down the line? Well, as concerning the equitable distribution of midwives in the, the whole country, even in remote and enclaves areas, uh, we know it's going to be a, a great challenge. Um, uh, midwives are considered in our society as high cadres. And uh, what we noticed during the graduation ceremony is that many of them were already pregnant themselves. Yeah. It means that they, they are getting married. And most of the time, uh, the, the because in, in my country, uh, civil servants are posted where the husband is. And so if the husband is in the main town, you are posted there. Uh, so this means that probably if the midwife gets uh, married, uh, the, the, the husband will, will be in the main town, and this will, will be a very, very, very big uh, bottleneck. Uh, so it is a big challenge. We are reflecting on it. Uh, before my coming here, we held uh, a, a, a workshop on this topic with uh, our developing partners, uh, UNFPA, GIZ, and French Operation Agency, WHIC, to, to find a way out to this problem. At the moment, we are experiencing a, a special program in the northern part of the country. Uh, we pay uh, special incentives to health workers who are willing to stay in that part of the country for a certain number of years. Uh, for now, we, we, we have enough funding for three years. We hope that uh, this shall be successful and that the government will come on board to sustain this kind of uh, policy. Yeah, thank you. Well, for us here in Liberia, what we did after the war, we were developing, we developed what we call the basic package of health services that included, it was like really clear on maternal, maternal health, and maternal child health. And then when we, we, after that in 2011, we developed what is called the essential package of health services. And in the essential package of health services, the odd line is staffing, in every facility, in every clinic, which is the lowest level, you must have a midwife. So a midwife there. The issue that we are having right now is that if someone is managing a clinic, then they want to have one midwife. And you will find that that person tend to work over mo uh, most of the time. So she can be doing antenatal care and she can be doing deliveries and then Another delivery comes, so she's like working overtime. So 
with this new one that they are developing now, the resilient health plan is looking at increasing the number of midwives. For the schools that have uh, public schools, during their three year stay, the Ministry of Health fund their, 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 their tuition. All of their fees are paid. And so after graduation, they assign them to a place to work. We having really serious problems of people even getting on the payroll or people staying to where they where they were assigned, mostly because of lodging problems that came about with the with the war when everything was destroyed. So the the plan is to look at lodging for health workers because when we did the we did a discrete choice survey and lodging was like one of the primary things that they wanted for them to be able to stay where they were. So the midwife is like considered a primary staff. You cannot operate a health facility with other, with other midwives. And then we now looking at the whole thing of lodging and then increasing the number of, of midwives that will be at that facility. Peter talked about engaging the people in the country. That like right now, we are trying to develop this plan and everyone is calling us and saying, we want you all to come and help us to do it. And it was simply because when we were doing the, the past project that just ended, when we started at the very beginning, we called everybody that knew anything about whatever we were talking about. So for the midwives, <laughs> we, we had a board, we had the association, we had the schools, we had people who consider themselves private consultants, what, who, if they were doing something connected to it, wanted for all of us to be together. And I think that was a primary reason for the success of the, the program that we just ended, in that we had everybody, so everybody could come and put something into the program. The thing about it is that it takes time and you need to like try to get people, but the whole value of having people with different expertise coming together and working on something, like the curriculum, we laugh at the curriculum because if you look inside, in terms of the people who developed the curriculum, we got like maybe 60, 60 names in it, you know. People are looking at different things and putting in different things and trying to help us. We have a, 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 a nurse midwife in, in country also who were part of the education committee for the ICM. So she's like very keen on making sure that for the curriculum, we following the ICM standards. And of course, like for Chipago, we had them, so she was like very happy, so she was happy to work along with us. So everybody came, but I think it's very, very important to look at those different aspects of people with different expertise and get them to come together, to work together. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, how the country can, uh, the, the equitable distribution, actually in Ethiopia, the whole program has to do with equitable distribution because we have nine regional governments and two special administration and the training program is being handled by those regional governments and uh, the, the students are from the same area and uh, usually uh, that, and actually, uh, What's happening now is there is an artificial saturation. In some of the regions, they uh, are uh, stopping training midwives, especially the accelerated midwife, uh, midwives, because uh, already uh, saying that we have already two uh, midwives in each uh, health center. But the thing is, how many people are they serving? And, and the other thing is because they don't have budget for the, uh, the civil servant, that's, that's one of the issues, and we are working on those things. And the, uh, working with uh, engaging experts in uh, generating evidences and decision, uh, I would say this is one of uh, our big challenge. Our universities, or uh, most of our, the experts from the outside, they're working in silo. And universities, they will do great jobs in some researches, but the research is not coming to the either the regional health bureau and the, the uh, policy makers, so that it will help us for evidence generation. And that's one of the problem because 
still, we don't have even the costing study of midwife and the others. And I will say that is the uh, one of the area we have to work with experts instead of just simply going for some uh, decision which has been made by politician because they're just uh, s looking into the big picture, but uh, to look the cost effectiveness, actually the efficiency of uh, some of the decision we are making. So I don't want to not give Donna the mic, um, <laughs> but, uh, but maybe if we could have a quick question and a quick response. Okay, well maybe this will be quick because I think that the countries that are represented here are all, I'm gonna say pro-midwifery, uh, having mm -hmm. done a lot already um, uh, moving towards uh, improving uh, in, uh, the ability of women to have access to midwifery care. But I'd like to ask a question about power. Um, and because your, your countries are all moving towards midwifery uh, in a broader sense, I'm wondering if um, midwives are at the table. When you're doing planning mm -hmm. uh, for ho human resources, uh, are, is there a midwife there? When you're d trying to figure out how to decrease your maternal and newborn health, is there a midwife there who can contribute that special knowledge and special ability that midwives have? I think that that is part of what can empower midwives to, um, to better do their jobs and to be recognized uh, uh, for, uh, you know, as, as, as a provider that has a lot of worth. Because I think in some parts of the world that is not the case and midwives are not recognized for that. Um, so I really would like to hear what you're doing um, because you are such proponents of the, pro the profession of that care. Thanks. So yeah, midwives at the table. Anybody in particular <laughs> want to answer that? For, for us, that, that, that was a very serious issue when we started in 2008. It, it, it was like you had nurses, and then the nurse, then the next people were the midwives. And then even in the maternity center, they, s they had nurses as supervisors, or at the school, or at the board. We call it a librarian board for nursing and midwifery. And we were only, I mean, everybody there was a nurse, except maybe for the president of the Librarian Midwifery Association. So it was this thing of making it loud all of the time. And we still have to be doing it, like even we were trying to develop this human resource package. And every time they would say nursing, I would say and midwifery. <laughs> you know, ev every, t every single time, but people are, Many people are, co are, are into that, that they will always say nursing. You know, if they're talking about nursing and midwifery, or they talk, as far as they're concerned, the two of them are the same. And even sometimes they want to say how you should do the training, whether the training is nursing or a midwifery. So all of the time we have to be like correcting people or adding, and then we say, where is the midwife? We're talking about midwifery. But I will tell you an interesting thing that happened. There was this organization that decided to, to do a, a proposal. And I kept telling them, you need to talk to these people. And they just, they were like, oh, they thought they could, they could do it. And then when they finally decided, we had to have, we had to call the, 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 minister, the deputy minister or health, the chief medical officer. She had to call everybody back and for everybody now to talk to and say this is what. And then she said, oh, I'm very proud of you people because you all have never done this thing like two years ago. You all have just sat there and listened to what people were saying. So I'm calling you for a meeting not because I want for you to, to do this, but I want for to say that I'm very proud that you, now you all can speak up, you know, so it has it has gone a long way, and I think the the conference in Dublin helped us a lot because we went back in the country. We say, look, nobody. If you want to run a, a midwifery school, you have to be a midwife. Maybe some of us were very loud with it, and so I remember one of the directors of the school. She left and had to go and do the nurse midwifery. Now she wants to leave so that she can go back to be the director of the midwifery school. So it's working out. 
from our side, I'll say actually from the ministry, uh, I have a midwifery team. They are midwife and they're a headache. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we have a really good team, and actually it's because they're midwives. And everywhere they go, they're always uh, just proud to introduce themselves. I'm uh, working in the human resource development and they're mid midwife. And in the schools, the departments and so on, they're midwives. There is a midwifery department. And in the law, the gap I will see is this, the midwifery led uh, maternity service. Uh, in the lower level, it's not a problem, especially in the uh, health center level. But when it comes to the hospital, I'm afraid there is some breaching because even though there is uh, uh, in some hospitals where there is a competent uh, midwife, especially those midwives with a uh, lot of experience who really manage the maternity uh, care. In the others, mostly it's being led by the either the general practitioner or uh, the others. And that's one of the gap we have to work. I just want to add something from the global level. That is a great question, Donna, uh, about midwives being at the policy level. And uh, you know, uh, UNFP has started this program with the ICM uh, in 2008. Uh, we started with about eight countries, and the first set of gap analyses that we did, uh, you know, this question about midwives m not having a voice and not being at the policy level, and uh, you know, mid midwifery not being regarded as a profession, you know kind of being looked down upon. I think from 2008 to now, there has been a huge shift, huge and, shift. and we are seeing that. It's perceptible now. Uh, and advocacy has played a great role, advocacy. It is, it is, we are not quite there, but we have come a long way. Uh, and, and we are seeing that. You know, there were countries who would say that, okay, because UNFP placed uh, midwifery advisors, and we wanted to place local uh, country midwife advisors who could work with the local stakeholders and work on, you know, curriculum revision, et cetera, you know, set up an association, regulation, et cetera. Uh, and there were countries who came to us and said that we cannot have a national midwifery advisor. We need an international one. Because uh, you know the governments would only listen to an international midwifery advisor, and Francis was there in those initial discussions going back seven years, and uh, really there has been a uh, perceptible shift now. Now, uh, secretary general strategy, every woman, every child strategy, almost fifty national commitments were for midwifery. You know, so that has that has helped. I mean, people r have started recognizing and openly accepting the state of the world's midwifery report made by all the partners in this room that has also helped uh, generate a lot of uh, you know support towards midwifery you know analytical the lancet series so all this i think these little little baby steps and uh, one question that peter raised uh, again i would i would uh, you know still say that 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 is a challenge there's so much of expertise in my view in my personal humble view uh, i would envision something where there's a global database where you have, you know, that these are the pockets of expertise because there are so many requirements for technical assistance. And, you know, okay, so this person is available at this time and can go to this country, like curriculum, which are the best curriculums that we have in Francophone Africa. So if there is a running database that, you know, people can access, because those are the kind of demands that keep coming. And there is expertise, but that is not really harnessed all the time. Yeah, thank you. In Cameroon, we don't have a midwifery council as yet, mm -hmm. uh, but from the onset of the process, we invited the midwifery association. It, it is linked to the ICM. Uh, their body need to grow. Uh, at the moment, um, their members are uh, almost all retired uh, midwives. Uh, but the good thing is that uh, this year they got 183 members and the registration fees were paid by a donor. So I think gradually uh, the number will increase and they, they will be able to put in place a council. But they, they, they still need to be sustained and I'm happy to, to, um, to grab the opportunity that is given to us in this panel because there are several uh, uh, very great expertise here 
and I think uh, the Cameroonian Association will really need support to put in place the, uh, all the, the regulation statutes and all the like. Yeah. Thank you. So speaking of who's at the table, we are not at the lunch table. So um, <laughs> why don't we do that? But I did want to make two quick announcements. I forgot to tell you three very important words earlier this morning, and that's that there's a reception to follow. Um, so please do factor that in um, towards the end of the day. And I also wanted to mention that there are restrooms one floor up that have a lot more stalls. So if, um, if it gets backed up here, feel free to head upstairs as well. Thanks. Thank you for the leave. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. <laughs> Best part here in Blue Country. Yes. You have one big battle. <laughs>